up, what's up, what's up? Yes, you are listening to my very short-lived rap career. Actually, it was um, a, uh, I guess you could call this a remix of a song that I did with a good friend of mine some time ago. Long, long, very long time ago. Jerry Hutchinson. And um, the title of the song was I Will Be Right There. But we needed a filler track for the for the um, record before it was released. So, um, no, it, 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 my man was like, laugh out loud. Yes, sir, laugh out loud. Because we just wanted to stick an additional track in just to fill the album out. So, yes, this was very short-lived, man. Very, very short-lived. But um, I enjoyed working with Jerry and, um, you know, having a bit of fun with him on this track. He's a phenomenal uh, keyboardist and a um, musician out here in New York. So um, yeah, man, it was a lot of fun just doing that and we just needed an additional track. And at the time, the brother was trying to fill out the record. What can you do other than be creative? You know what I mean? But yes, um, listen, thank you to everybody who is here today. I appreciate you. I just want you to know that. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Got a lot to cover, man. Um, this was starting out in initially uh hello armando my brother how are you and um sdm films you was laughing at my um my rap man but listen this brother was just trying to get the job done you know what i mean <laughs> but links for life yeah links for life dreams have no expiration that's true man hey listen it, no, it wasn't a dream. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be no rapper. No, I was merely trying to just stick another another track on on a, on a record that was um, needing a uh, an additional track just be before it was released. That's all that was, you know. You know, sometimes um, when you well back in the day, you know, you were a track or two shy. You want to just make sure that you have enough. Um, um, material out there to offer the consumer so that's what that was uh deborah yes good afternoon good to see you thanks for tuning in i appreciate you but yeah that's what that was man but it was a lot of fun you know listen and and um i'm not going to get into all the details of how it was recorded i'm going to do that in a future not live stream but in a future um uh video you know where i talk about you know people get hung up on um and that's why this thing, this with this unboxing, has become more of a um, detailed video. A lot of I keep getting mail from folks that um, get hung up, and I mean they really do get hung up on brands. And um, I'm still getting hate mail about the whole warm audio thing, <laughs> ironically. And that's okay, man. Everybody has an opinion, and I'm not anti-opinion. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time. Um, if I told you how I recorded most of the records in my life, you know, it gets, it, it's, it's not about the equipment. That's, that's my overarching point, you know, and, um, it's about musicianship and the music that, that you're releasing, you know, and that's, that's the, um, that's the, you know, about the size of it. You know, people get hung up on, well, what brand should I buy and this and that and the third and, um, I think this unboxing, you know, as I was preparing for the unboxing during the week, um, I kept getting a lot of male people inquiring about what's the best. And I was like, you know what? I'm about to do this unboxing. I said, let me just do a little bit more research, you know, because it's been a minute since I've used an, an actual 1176 in the studio, that is, and I don't own one. So I said, um, let me just you know, peruse, you know, some, some, some information regarding the history, you know, you know, as a kid, you, you just, you know, when I was in, involved as a, as a, as a tracking engineer early on, you many years ago, it was just about use this for that, use this for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, um, you don't, I didn't get, you know, and most, I mean, yeah, most young people like that. And I was once upon a time young. So most people like, listen, this is the tool. This is what that tool does. It sounds good on that. So use that. And that's cool. But never got into the history and the, the, 
knew 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 the history of the of the eleven seventy six to a degree, and understanding that Bill Putnam, you know, um, I think forget the name of the studio he had out in California before UA was started by his um, sons, but um, n knowing that he, I think he was involved in Yuri and Yuri was was one of the big audio companies back in the day. You know, I felt it was an, it was necessary for me to um, just delve a little deeper into the history of the component and um, dispel a few myths, you know, um, regarding, you know, the 1176 and many other recreations that are out nowadays, you know. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a little background, a little bit of history, um you know, based on my experiences with the equipment, you know, in an outside facility years ago. And now fast forward to right now where a lot of these patents as well as um, schematics from these designs are now coming off of patent. And now the information is available to, you know, anybody and for anyone to, you know, to create. So, um, before I get into questions, let's just jump into a little bit of, um, history and, and, um, some quick education about, you know, um, the different types of compressors. Okay. Really fast. FET, VCA, optical, and mu. There are four different types. I'm going to run through really quick four that you will most likely encounter in either plug-in form or an actual form. FET is more the 1176 is now there are many iterations of uh, a FET compressor made by many people from Jeffrey Daking all the way down to um, uh, Fredenstein, you know, with their iteration of a FET compressor. VCA is more uh, like an SSL or DBX. Uh, compressor 165A is a, is a VCA compressor. David Blackmere is the the grandfather or the 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 founder i should say of of dbx and uh, the the person who initiated and introduced vca uh compression to the audio industry many 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 years ago <coughs> excuse me optical is an la2a and mu is a fairchild an optical compressor um the la2a uses a a, a, an, a photo cell which triggers gain reduction and mu is more like a a fairchild you know 670 which has a very very and also the the uh, manly very mu um those are mu compressors which primarily use cathode tubes you know in their compression technology now what does each do um Effect compressor is what they call a field effect transistor. It's a transistor, you know, a transistor like a, um, I'm just, you know, recategorizing a few things like a resistor or a, um, or a capacitor, you know. Now, one of the, the, the overarching effects of, a, of a, any transistor, even your radio, if you, if you ever had one of the, I'm dating myself now, transistor radios, if you cranked it up, and if it was overdriven, it had a harsh sort of sound. So with a FET compressor, you know, when you overdrive it, you're going to expect the distortion to square off the wave that it's, um, that's overdriving the transistor. VCAs, or more like the SSLs or the, or the DBX 165As, um, when you're talking about a, a, um, it's also a transistor design, okay? Don't get me wrong. Although a VCA is a chip as well, it's a transistor. But at the same time, what David Blackmere did, he utilized mathematics, like a, a log, what they call a logarithm. Now, I'm no electrical or mechanical engineer. I'm, you know, anybody wants to, you know, fact check me on it, you're, you're free to do so. But he used mathematics to determine how much you know, um, compression is going to be applied, you know, over the course of a, um, course of time based on the signal that's presented to it. Again, I am no electrical or mechanical engineer, 
but my understanding of when you're dealing with a VCA type of compression, you know, you're going to have a, a sloping type or hard knee, soft knee and hard knee type of effect on the sound. But at the same time, it can have a sort of squeezing effect. So whereby when you overdriving a, a, a FET, it may square off the, the signal. When you're dealing with a VCA, you may have more of this like squeeze sort of sound. You know, um, the best I can give you an example is if you listen to It's No Crime by um, Babyface and listen to the knock, pop, the pop from the snare drum. You know, if you probably fed that same snare drum with the FET, it might distort. But the 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 characteristic of a um, VCA compressor will cause it to give this overarching soft, the rounder sort of tone to the um, compression effect, if you will. Okay, um, let's jump forward. Optical, of course, slower in um, its initial um, attack. You know, that's because, of course, light travels in time. You're using a photo cell to trigger gain reduction. All right. And um, mu uses cathodes, a very slow attack time, but the sound is so smooth. You know, um, mu compressors use, cat use cathode tubes. Um, not many people are using them nowadays for very... Um, um, obvious reasons. Uh, Manly has managed to come out with the very mule, which again, I mean, my God, $5,000, if I had it, I would buy one. Um, but the Fairchild, um, issued in that sort of, that sort of warm tone. Now, here's a good thing. I don't know if any of you watched my video on the, um, when I did the, um, Clark Technic um, LA two way replication. And I said how the, the, the tubes provided this warming sound to an acoustic, um, instrument. I was recording acoustic bass at the time. And, um, you know, when you become disconnected with something over a period of time, like I, like I said, I don't own, I didn't own an LA two way in my place. Um, I, because of the music I was involved in, which required more of a VCA based compression, which I was using a lot. You see my rack is loaded with a lot of DBX, you know, 166 and one, um, 163Xs. Um, but once you reconnect, um, with a, the, um, like when I was doing the, 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 um, the Clark Technic review of the LA two way, you reconnect with that warmth that tubes provide. Now here's a good thing. Um, the Clark Technic version, you know, again, presents with you a, a slower attack time, but here's the kicker. With mu compressors, you get the benefit of having the tubes, the 12AX7, 12BH7 tubes inside to give you that warm sort of tone to the sound. So, um, you know, years ago, I didn't even make that connection. And now to, you know, have this clone, clone, I hate saying the word clone, but replica come along and reconnect me with something that I was familiar with years ago, working in outside studios that had these, um, bits of technology from, from, um, um, Yuri and, and from, you know, teletronics, you know, it's like, wow, all the things that I was missing, you know, for so many years, you know, your, your, your ear reconnects itself with something it was familiar with, not necessarily in your own possession, but in your, um, travels and in dealing with, uh, you know, work that I had to do in outside studios as a tracking engineer, you, you say, wow, that sound was pretty, uh, familiar to me back then using, you know, you know, those, those bits of technology. So nowadays to, to be able to have at your disposal, you know, um, replicas of some classic pieces. It makes sense to go out and buy, you know what I mean? They are not falling short in terms of offering you the best of technology. So for the purists, I say this, um, if you have the money and you feel like, uh, you know, I want the best of the best, of course you can't in some respects beat 
the legacy of a of a of a UA eleven seventy six or LA two A replica. They're replicas also. They're not the original. Teletronics was the original uh, manufacturer of the LA two A. Yuri came along. I mean, U Universal Audio came along and recreated it. You can't beat um, the, the 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 craftsmanship that went into making an actual Universal Audio LA two A. It was a hand. It's a handmade piece, and anything that's handmade, you know, it requires time. It requires effort. It requires um. Uh, attention to being paid to detail but in the at the same time does that make it better than the Clark Technic maybe yes maybe no depends on who you're asking the only way I feel um, there is to tell is if you open up the unit and look at what's inside I go always back to my old mac and cheese anatomy anatomy an analogy anatomy <laughs> what was you drinking brother um analogy you know um when you go out and if you for those of you who like mac and cheese you know you don't look at what's inside you know if it's all soupy and warm and nasty looking you ain't gonna eat it period you know because of the way it's presented you know but if it looks like some care and craftsmanship and quality went into it and that's the same thing with these components that we're using nowadays you know, capacitors are capacitors, but there are varying levels of quality capacitors that can one can buy. And I'm going to prove that today because, again, with all the questions I've been receiving all week, I said, you know what, let me dive a little deeper. Before I just go through and unbox, let's dive a little deeper into the truth behind, you know, these things that are now coming off of patent. Now the technology and the schematics are available to anyone. OK, including the DIY community, which helped in my research and providing, I hope today, the best information to give you in terms of making an intelligent choice and purchase. OK, so let's fast forward real quick. What to expect from effect type compressor It's flexible. You can use it on vocals, drums guitar cabs it's going to give you some character if you overdrive it that's what the all buttons in mode is about um you've heard that on many 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 records it has an aggressive squaring off of the transients it's great for pop music applications and at the same time it will give you a dissatisfying sound if you don't take care to set it Properly. I'm going to say this once and I'm going to say it once and hopefully for all. It can be open to debate. You know, I'm sure people will rewatch this and they can debate me. But I think the purpose of I think I know the purpose of a compressor is to tame out of control transients and to more or less balance out the dynamics over the course of an over the course of recording um, information. Most people, and this is this is a beef that I have with a lot of the videos that I have. That's why I'm hoping that this information comes off as helpful. Most people that 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 I see doing these um, reviews of this equipment, they get on and they start twisting knobs like, you know, like like it's you know a game, you know, and that's I think that's giving the individual person bad information in terms of making an attempt to provide them with the best possible um, um, information that's going to make them an informed consumer. First of all, what are you going to use this on? Now, it's a very flexible piece of equipment that's giving you a lot of character if you don't said it properly if you don't take care to learn it i think we had mentioned that last week about a couple of pieces of equipment that um i was talking about so one has to learn the characters just like you know for those of us who, who who are married or when you when you're dating you don't jump headlong into the relationship you got to learn 
the person learn, you know, what they like, what they don't like, you know, you, you're making an informed, you know, decision, you know, about what birthday gift you're going to buy them. If you're in a dating relationship and the same rules apply to your equipment, you have to learn what are the characteristics, what happens if I do this? You know, it can be a very, very flexible piece of equipment used in the right way. Okay, so let's just keep those things in, in mind. All right. Before I jump ahead to the unboxing, let's take a couple of questions and then I'm going to make one final point that I think everyone should really, really, really hone in on. So let's go from the top. My baby girl just gave me a thumbs up. Hey, baby. I love you, mama. Um, is it good to use two compressors for tracking? Um, if you're tracking, um, once you print it, bro, it's printed. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm coming from the tape days. You can't undo it. Uh, yeah, you can, I don't see a need for it unless the person just has like absolutely abysmal mic te technique and you're just trying to find a way just to fix this thing. But, um, I, I, once you print it, it's committed, you know, you can't undo it. So keep that in mind. If you're using two compressors, Shazam, the iPad producer is in the hizzy. He says he's late. No, you ain't brother. There's always the replay button, but I'm glad you're here, man. Um, analog. Hi, Warren. Don't you think the KT 76 doesn't have the mojo of a real 1176? Okay. That's again, debatable. Um, you might be correct in some respects. You know what? Um, let's just look at it from this perspective, okay? From a thousand feet. You might be right, but I'm going to show you something very, very important that I, I um learned in my research this week that kind of, you know, kind of shaped the direction that I wanted to take the unboxing. It shaped it totally because again, you might be right, and it depends on the person that you're talking to, you know. Uh um mojo if you say mojo the only way to really say that definitively or not is to get it into the studio with the source that you're about to record and put it through its paces in the same exact way that's the only way one could make that uh, uh analogy other than that it's just an opinion as far as i'm concerned and everybody got an opinion that's fine that's cool but um, it's just a matter of, of, of opinion, you know, at that point, you got to put it through its pace. You have to be able to definitively say, listen, man, I went to record guitar and I put the all buttons in mode and I strummed a power chord through this 1176 and I printed it. Listen to this. And I strummed the power chord through this, um, KT 76. Listen to that. And then, you know, you can't argue with facts. You know, I remember my, um, I had a, uh, my father-in-law just said one time, you know, most people don't like taking pictures because pictures don't lie, you know, and that's true. You knew if once it's printed, you listening to, you like, yo, this is whack. If it's whack and you know, you, you, I know that this was recorded. Well, that's indisputable, you know, then it, you can say, yeah, the mojo, but see, you know, folks throw out terms you know, so willy nilly and, 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 and I'm not talking about you, by the way, I'm just saying, you know, um, just for the sake of argument, you know, people throw out terms and again, you gotta, you know, put it through its paces and say definitively, I know I've used it in this way and you can't argue with that. You know, if it's printed, you can't argue with, listen to this. If you could say, listen to this, you know, then. You might have, you know, somewhat of a valid argument. I don't mind debate. I just wish that folks, when they put stuff up with, you know, at least and make an attempt to try and do an honest uh, 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 thing at informing people. That's the primary situation I have when I see these reviews. So on with, with a few um, uh, more questions, it says, Chad Seamus 20 say, hey, it's good to, good to see you, brother. I'm glad you're here. And I'm not going to say this is analog says, I'm not going to say that the KT76 is a bad compressor, but maybe if someone searched the 1176 Mojo, it should be a wrong choice. Again, everyone's mileage may vary. 
But I'm going to use one final point that you might wind up agreeing with me. Be, you know, yo, B, you know, you might be right about that whole I'm filling the blank. But I'm going to share with you in the end. We're going to unbox in a minute and then I, I'll share my final point. And then it's up to the individual. Like I said, if you're just if, if one is a purist, you know, it's just like um, I remember when Branford Marsalis played with Sting and everybody's oh my god oh you know pearl clutching jazz pierce oh my god Branford is playing with sting so what he's gotta eat too you know i mean in the end you know but he's a jazz musician like god forbid that that should happen you know it, it becomes the same thing with our equipment you know is it, is it getting the job done you know you got to ask yourself that that um that um question in the end so, <laughs> okay, I gotta listen. I gotta go. Chad Seaman says $2,300 versus $400. i am picking the $400 joint. See, my man, was you looking over my shoulder when I was preparing my notes for today? That ain't right. <laughs> okay, Ninja 6485. The thing to remember with the 1176 is the attack time in microseconds, not milliseconds. True. True, true, true. As I don't know the conversion, I ain't no mathematics, but I mean, that's like ridiculously fast, ridiculously flat, fast. As a matter of fact, if anyone wants to look up for me right now, you know, um, how many milliseconds equal microseconds, then that'll give you an extremely good idea as to why this thing is like, it chomps, you know, it's very aggressive sounding fast. So yeah, um, Ninja 6485, thanks for saying that, man. Thank you for saying that because that's an important, very, very, very important point. Kudos to you for saying that. Links for life. What revision though? It's revision D, this particular unit, as I'm understanding. So um again. John 415 asks, Am I still looking for the dangerous two busing two bus summing mixer? He has one on sale for eight hundred bucks on two bus. Yeah, unfortunately, man, I had to put that whole situation on hold, B, because um, money is a little funny in this coronavirus times. You know, I, I, again, I'm going a few streams back. Uh, you know, in one day, I lost like three gigs. Bang. And one of them was like going to take care of me <laughs> for a while. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, man, that, that would be a good thing. But, I, you know, I had to put the whole update thing on, um, upgrade thing on the whole for a minute. Ninja, at thank you for love. Uh, revision D. Okay, yes. Chaz Seamus says, looking forward to checking this out. You guys think this is a good compressor for someone starting out with hardware? <laughs> Listen, man. Okay, uh, let me just answer that question like this. And then we're going to unbox. Capacitors are capacitors. You go on mouser.com, you will see there are varying levels of capacitors. Capacitors are, 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 you know, can vary by company, Texas Instruments, Nishanon. They have varying companies that put capacitors out, just like resistors. You have metal film resistors. You have little cheap resistors. Whatever goes, whatever components a manufacturer chooses to put into their equipment determines the sound, period. Point blank, full stop. That's why Warm is making a killing right now. He's smart. He's mastered economies of scale. He is a businessman. Smart people know and understand if you buy in bulk, that's why some of y'all shop at Costco. You know, you go down to Pookie and them on the corner for your toilet paper, you're going to pay a dollar a roll. Or dollar fifty, but if you go to Costco and you buy in bulk, maybe you'll pay twelve dollars for a batch. It's economies of scale. That's why Costco is making money hand over fist. They understand the business model. Bryce understands that business model. Everybody with brains right now that looks at a schematic understands the business model. And if buying, the more you buy. Resistors from mouser.com. You can go on you or go on YouTube. Go on your web browser right now. Type in mouser. Just type in resistors. You're gonna see a litany of them coming up with varying prices less than a penny. 
based on the amount you bought. So if I know that um, it's going to cost you uh, ten dollars, let's just say, for a thousand resistors, you know, those resistors can be used in several components. So if you buy in bulk now, you can produce God only knows how many of these things for how much. The cost comes down. The cost of production comes down. So if you buy in bulk, right? You buy them in bulk and your labor is approximately $9 an hour. The cost to make one of these things is, is probably what? 200 bucks. You go to the market and you sell it for double the amount. Who's the fool? <laughs> you know, it gets down to that. Everybody wants, oh, this is just whack. It's not, it does not, it's not 11 cents. Who is the fool? Because if you pry it open, which I'm going to do, trust me on that one. I open up everything and look inside. Every piece of equipment, I, I open it up to see what it's made out of because it's made out of crap. And I can tell you definitively, Golden Age products, projects stuff is crap. I've had it crap out on me on a client gig. And I said, never more will I use this. But when I got it back at the studio, at my place, I opened it up and I looked inside. I was like, no wonder. No name brand capacitors, no name brand resistors, whack um, transformers. Come on. So it's no wonder that it's not functioning properly. But when you crack something open and you see they got quality components and you crack up, what is separating an, an actual UA1176, okay, what is separating an actual UA1176 from the WA76? Um, someone said it earlier, Chaz Seamus. He said, $2,300 versus $400. I'm picking the $400 joint. That's this. That's that. And like I said, in my research this week, I tallied up $397 in parts just to build an 1176 by hand. Now that is a variable cost and you, and I've, I've put the sources down. They will be in the description as well. You can go and cite my sources because I don't want nobody coming back and say, oh, you give me out bad information. This is fact. Go and fact check me if you want to. Then I looked at the cost. It's a $2,000 difference. The only justification for $2,000 is labor period. So y'all that want to just go out and buy and spend $2,400, don't do that. It's a handmade piece of equipment. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But what you should do is consider this as well. They're virtually the same. Based on the same revision. Built in the same kind of way. With class A output which means that class A means that it's operating all the time. It's not on off like a class D sort of um, amplification, you know, custom built transformers. Now, Yuri, I mean, universal order, I said Yuri, um, is probably has their own proprietary ones, but they're, they're, they're the same unit. The only, and, 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 and Clark Technic up the ante by giving you a 10 year warranty. You get one year is hand built in the USA. So the only justification truthfully for paying $2,400 is labor, labor. So if, if you want to go and, you know, give somebody $2,000 for a hand built piece, then you do that. But the, I mean, I'm not saying that this it, it's um, any better or worse. The only way you could, you as an independent consumer have to make that decision. You have to make that decision. Okay. I jumped to the ending. So that's the, the, the best that, 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 um, one could do, you know, you have to determine, Hey man, is, is, is am I, you know, I mean, it's going to sound that much better. $2,000 better. Maybe, maybe not. Only thing you could do is put up the mic, put the preamp, feed the output of the preamp into the compressor, do your thing. Get the other one, do the same thing, and let your ears be the judge. Period. Period. But um, let's get into, I've never, 
looked at this unit first time for everybody so let's unbox it all right here we go here we go I'm taking it out the camera y'all be like yeah but what's this brother doing he ain't gonna take the thing out the camera make sure i don't do it in the wrong way oh, here we go okay so all right looks in looks well looks well packaged we got the power cord off to the right all right and i would <laughs> i would get my um my um my screwdriver out and crack it open but that'll take too long we'll be here all day and half the night all right and um yes here's the quick start guide by the bing throw that back more foam it's well packaged i can tell you that you know and let's close the box back oh, let me put this on my lap real quick it's got some weight to it that's a good thing i'm gonna do another follow-up video by the way because i am gonna open this thing i definitely want to see what type of components you know is used you know, so, um, Secret Armor said, just in time, peace. Yeah, man, you got to check out the spiel, B. Um, this is, um, this is impressive so far. Uh, okay, plastic, and, and then how many of y'all remember this? Da, 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 the script, the song, this is supposed to be a, you know, family program, so. Keep it clean. All right. Okay. Oh, another thing I want to tell y'all, do not throw these out. I don't know how many of y'all throw these silica gel things out, but um, what you really should do, if you, have an, if you have your equipment in an environment where the temperature shifts and you have a rack, try and throw these in the back of the rack because what they do, they take humidity away from your equipment. So um, don't throw these little packs of silica gel out. They're useful and they're reusable. So just a little side note all right so let's put it up here now first impressions um good looks good the knobs feel certain on the input output knob feels certain attack knob release off certain the buttons wow well let me compare the action to my 1073 the action on it feels just about equal that's important because you know these buttons you're going to put them through a lot of um you know uh action over time and they have to be able to stand up i mean but these things fail easily you know so um you know this determines i'm going to look up the, the 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 quality of the buttons that they use on mouser as well so now these military like this thing is solid so um initial impressions are good you know let me know if if, if y'all gonna hang around i will go and get the screwdriver and i will take this thing apart and look at it but initial impressions are very good it seems to be well made um I like the fact also that what they did, they, um, you could use a tweaker, you know, for those of you, when this thing warms up, you got to make sure that if you're using it to determine gain reduction, it has to be at zero. Don't just stick it on and just start getting all crazy with it. Um, make sure that if you have the gain reduction, and this is anytime you're using, you know, this type of equipment. If you're going to use the game, the meter in the gain reduction fashion, it has to sit at zero. It can't be off zero below or above it. You want it to give you as accurate a reading as possible, you know, um, in, in your effort to determine the proper gain reduction that you are giving a source. So make sure that it's sitting at zero. And I think they put like a little, um, tweaker um screw so that you can stick a tweaker in there and tweak it so that it gets to zero when you're using it and you might have to do it more than once so that's a good thing um any takers for 
Are the knobs detented? No, they are not. No, they're not. Uh, this is old school, B. You got to go and get you some of this. <laughs> you're going to have to get with the gaff tape situation. You're like, you know, I had a session last night. If you put it, you're going to have to stick it right there. If you know they're coming back the next day, you know, it's like that. You know, that's that's the old school way of doing things, you know. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's the way that goes. But no, the knobs are not detented. Um, I do not think you'll be as happy as your KT2A. Hey, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, you might be correct. And, um, because I've never really, and this is my personal, this is from a personal perspective based on the music that I've done most of my life. Um, been a huge fan of an 1176 because of the character. It's not making it bad because of the character. You know, I wasn't willing to risk my money just to have a character piece sit in my studio and my project studio, that is period. So, I mean, most of my career outside of here was using pieces like this, but I always fell in love with the DBX because of the sound. Now that these things are being given away, essentially, I can, you know, have it sitting around here. And if I like it, good. If I like it on a piece, good. If I don't, then I just remove it and put something else in its place. It's like that, you know, but to spend $2,400 for a piece that's going to sit in the rack. Nah, man. Come on, man. Who got that kind of money? I mean, if you got that kind of money, you, I mean, that that's the situation you running, then fine. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> Me? I ain't spending that kind of money if I ain't got to. You know? I mean, there are times when, you know, if you're doing business outside and a client comes to you and says, hey, can you get a hold of a piece like this? And you are being paid, then that's a different situation. Okay. Or if you, if your business has reached a level where you can, where people cost is no option, then good for you. I'm not mad at you. Honestly, I'm not, you know, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, this is a bastardized, you know, replica of the act real thing because everybody's mileage may vary period. You know, um, I've never, I have never in my place used an 1176 for vocals, only optical as well as VCA. Those have been the two that I've used throughout the many years that I've been working. But now I get a chance to date and learn and, and sit with the thing for a minute. You know, when you're an employee, as I was as a tracking engineer at some studios in the Daily Planet building back in the day, um, you're an employee for an, of X amount of hours a day, you know, or in my case at night, you know? So how much time do you get a chance to spend and learn your equipment, learn what characteristically, you know, what characteristics is going to impart on X source or Y source that's now I had the time to sit with it and experiment. It ain't costing the client money. It's not costing my employer money. I am the employer. So now I can sit around and dilly dally with it all day, you know, and I can tell you definitively, Hey, I use this on vocals and ah, nah. So um, links for life says it's nice on rap vocals. I would imagine. So as a matter of fact, B, I was listening to, um, uh, quite a, a lot of, um, hip hop last night as well as, but I just happened to hang on two artists, Mary J. Blige's first record. And I know where that was recorded as well as um, C.C. Peniston, you know, just listening to some of the characteristics of the 1176 as it was used on drums. It imparts a character, you know. Now, you're going to either like it or you're not. But you can't, one thing like um, I forgot who, who um, said earlier is, is, you know, you got to be able to a little, be a little judicious in the way that you're setting your attack time because this thing is aggressive. You can't be all dun, 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 and getting crazy with the attack time. And then it's going to be like, you're not going to find a sweet spot. Why? Because you've never taken the time to learn where the sweet spot is for certain types of instruments or vocals. So now for 400 bucks, you get a chance to do that. Hey, I'm for it. I'm with it, you know, and then let's just say, for instance, you, when you buy it from a retailer, you pay all this money for an 11, actual 1176 and you don't like it and they have no return policy, you know, or 
I'm going to shout them out because they did this to me. You know, Sweetwater got a little funny on me because, you know me, if I don't like it, I'm sending it back. They got all funny like, oh, well, you know, you send pieces back. You know, I can't. I'm like, you know what? I will find somebody else to buy from. Because, you know, they, you know, listen, that's a whole other story, man. I had to had some beef with them because Sweetwater has been with me. I've been with Sweetwater for over 20 years and they got real funny on me one time. Real funny. Yeah, I'm calling them out. So if they see the video, too bad. Too bad. But that's a whole other story for another day. But um, yeah, man. Um, anywho. Uh hey Warren, how are you doing? I'm late. What did I miss, Mr. Parbrain? You didn't miss anything, my brother. I'm just um sitting here talking about the the um un we unboxed the um Clock Technic KT seventy six. And so far I'm impressed, man. I'm impressed with its weight, its build. I'm anxious to open this thing up. As you all know, I pro will, not probably, definitely will, just to see, you know, what components are on the inside. Now, again, I did some research this week on um, this, this DIY form where someone made an actual revision D and the total parts cost they used was $397, you know? So... You know, one would have to question, you know, the justification, if you will, you know, and I'm not shouting on Universal Audio. Honestly, I'm not. They are a phenomenal company. They know I love them, period. Point blank, full stop. They know that. It's just that one would have to justify when both companies, both Clark Technic and Universal, we're looking at the same schematic, all of our white coats, white coats, people who are going to build this thing are looking at this one schematic and we're going to source components from the same, you know, a provider. We're going to source capacitors, resistors. We may buy our, our, um, transformers from different people, but you know, we're going to build the same unit. Will they sound differently? Marginally, most likely, you know, you know, so that is to be expected. Uh, SDM film says, open it up. If I get one more person that says for me to open it up, I'm going to jump and go get those screwdrivers and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So if I get one more person, I just don't want to, um, you know, break the flow that we have happening so far. Star studio says, congratulations. Thank you, my brother. I'm glad to see you. And I'm glad you are here. John 415. He, he, here's a good thing. He says, um, uh, I have both the warm W A T and the, okay. Here's, here's a person. Okay. See, this is what I'm talking about. When folks who know, now I'm going to trust what he says because he's giving me his firsthand experience. You know, not some guy on YouTube twisting knobs like a crazy person. This is a guy. And John, I really wish, man, that um, uh, I've been making a call for y'all to send me videos of your studio. I, I'm going to have to just do something and just let you all know. Um, yeah, somebody says open it up. Okay, good. I got five people saying to open up. You can hang on a second. Let me go get them screwdrivers. I'll be right back. I shall return. is back I is back got to trust the screwdrivers all right so let's see which this looks like a torx hang on a second because i do believe in i do believe the proof is truly in the pudding sound is one thing but what you got in your mac and cheese is a whole other situation don't be giving me no watery mac and cheese because guess what a brother will say, I'm quite all right. Thank you very much. Put that back. I ain't playing. Don't give me no wax stuff. So for those of you who always who are wondering now, what is he talking about? I always use the mac and cheese analogy. You know, 
Everybody ain't gonna eat everybody's food just like that. And I am one. Up oh, founder on the founder on the first try. So let's take the first screw out the top. And uh, yeah, she's in there too. <laughs> she's in there. I thought this was a family show. Stop with them, them funny analogies, young man. But yeah, man, it's, it's you, you know, like I said, they source their components from pretty much all the same manufacturers. And if you're building one yourself as a DIY person, you're going to do the same. You're going to go to the same people, <laughs> the same people. You're going to buy the same capacitors, you know. They got cheaply and poorly made capacitors, and they have really good ones. <laughs> Let me see, is this a two-part? Yes, the part, the top is two parts. So let's see what they got going on in here. Ah. Wow, they got these things in here, B. They got these joints up in here. So, any other questions? Don't sound the same. Uh, I'm sorry. I Two identical devices from the same company. That's true. That's true. That's why you know. It, it, good. Listen, that's another good point. That's another. Thank you for saying that. Because guess what? Guess what? If any of y'all go out and buy two U87s and you go to Neumann and say, hey, I need a matched pair, you're going to pay premium, B. If they built, if you getting them things like first hand, or if you send them back and say, listen, I need a matched pair, it's going to cost you something. Because they have to go through extringent testing to make sure that it specs out almost the same. I mean, you can't be deviating. You know, when you talk about having a match pair of anything, so I got, okay, I got most of the top of them. Let me get the back screws and the back screws. Are they Torx as well? Uh, let's hope so. Let's hope. Uh, no, she's turning too much. No, that's turning too much. That's because it's a little wider, a little wider, wider. Stay there. And yeah, man, I mean, when you, when they're manufacturing the equipment, sure, sure, you know. No. So let me just see, make sure I got the right size here. So I don't want to strip, you know, you strip these torch joints, you you are really messed up. Okay, I got the right one. And brother don't want to just, you know, get screws all stripped off the top. Have you, anybody y'all you know, ever stripped a screw or something? Like in the, the worst is when you strip a screw in the rack. Jesus. Jesus. I got stories, stories, and my young stories of, boy... Mistakes, mistakes you have made. I remember the first time I was recording with a an Atari machine, <laughs> and you know if you worked on an Atari machine, they had the the sync safe mode, and I thought I hit the record button and the record light lit up, but that sync safe mode was still on, on the on the um remote control. Man, I thought I was recording the whole performance. Got it. The tape was blank, B. Blank. Okay. Oh, no. Hey, okay. Nah, man, they put some good stuff up in here. Hold on a second. All right. Nah, see, that's what I was saying. <laughs> All right. They got Nishinon capacitors up in here. Really good ones. All right, and the and the um push buttons as well on the inside. Oh, I can't show, but these I was talking about how these are are made and constructed. Ah oh, man, these are really good, really good component. Okay, yeah, they got some good components in here, man. Mhm. Mm the capacitors appear to be made, but they sourced them from Nishinon. N I C H I N O N. They're one of the big capacitor um, makers out here, but the um, the build quality on it appears to be very well made. All the components are are on a PCB board, you know. So whereas on an actual 1176, maybe they have a PCB, but it was hand soldered, which is a very good way of making equipment, don't get me wrong. But um, this was probably also soldered by hand, but at the same time done in China. 
Uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. For those who want Oh, you know. You stick two people on a manufacturing bench, right? And one speaks no English and the other one speaks English. One's from America, one from China. And they both lift their soldering irons up at the same time and solder at the same time. Does it make, and they're using the same components. Does it necessarily make one better than the other? No. <laughs> they're both doing the same job, soldering. It's just that one's paying, being paid $9 an hour. Maybe the other guy's being paid $25, $30 an hour. That's where the cost of is going to come in at, in the labor. So it doesn't make a difference. But from what I can see, I'm going to, um, they got Midas, um, both input and output transformers. Now, the, the inside boards were probably, these little boards in here, were probably wave sided by a machine. Okay, so these were probably something that they sent pre soldered to China to get done. But um, the other components, all the capacitors appear to be made by Nishinon. They, some of them are so tiny, I got old eyes, so I'm gonna have to put a microscope underneath these things. But um, Nishinon capacitors, Clark Technic provided all the PCBs, looks like, on the inside, the PCBs. I can't say anything bad about the manufacture, the process of manufacture, honestly. And believe me, this is coming from a person who opened up Golden Age uh, project stuff. And I was horrified, horrified. I was like, oh my God, it was no wonder that this thing failed in the gig. It was no wonder. It was no wonder because it was a piece of junk. But from what I can see, the build quality on it is, oh man, look at this. Hang on a second. Listen to this. Um... Borns pots, Borns, B-O-U-R-N-S, Borns pots are used for these, these, these components here. And those are very high quality potentiometers. So, I mean, I can't say nothing bad about this. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. So it's getting down to just the manufacturer. Um, I see, um... Polystyrene, they have some polystyrene capacitors as well. This is well made. This is well made. For, for, I mean, by and large, no cheap components on the inside. No cheap components whatsoever. You know, and the build quality appears to be um, pretty spot on as well. So, uh, uh, you know, how does it sound? Mm, you know, only that's to be determined. But from what I can see, like I said, I opened up first hand and that was going to happen one way or the other. <laughs> I'm going to tell you because I need to know what's, what's on the inside for, you know, again, if I'm going to make an attempt to provide you with good information as to whether or not you should purchase something, then you have to know that the guts are good. Okay, now let's hear how it sounds. And everybody's mileage may vary, man. Um, I wish I could, but what I might use it on and what you might use it on might be different. You know, the only, and, and to be honest with you, okay, to, to, to get in all seriousness, the only way to see how something sounds, you have to run it through a litany of genre, genres and dynamics because all dynamics are not the same. Everyone does not um, inflect on how they the timbre of their voice comes across in a particular circumstance. You could take Chaka Khan and you could take, you know, Mary J and you could take um Garessa Sylvester, three iconic singers, and put them all and all of them sing the same song, Sweet Thing. They're all going to have varying levels of inflection and dynamics in the way they sing something. So again, it gets all the way back to folks that are putting stuff up and reviews up and then they just I mean randomly twisting knobs is it's not giving any body who's there to peruse for the purpose of being an informed consumer of this good if you're trying to buy it you, you, you they're not giving you good information good information so I say buy it one yes the bill quality is very good um Oh, you said you you want to hear how so I meant listen to it here in the video just for fun.
for good. No, you know what I'm going to do? No, I am going to do another video. I think it will be best. You'll be better served. And maybe I'll have a link where you can download the actual audio files as well. Um, I'm going to put a, 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 a funk bass on it. I want to try something with funk bass as well as with um, bass um, keys. You know, I, I, I'm i going to put it through its paces. I'm not going to just leave you high and dry like that. Yeah, it's, it's going to get put through its paces. But again, you know, for the sake of um, information for everyone here, it's a matter of um, using it in your place and you liking it based on what you've used it on. You know, because again, like I say to everyone, everyone's mileage may vary. You know, what may sound great to you may be like, oh my God, when I hear it, it'd be like, nah. And you'd be like, yo, I like that. You know, but maybe we have a differing opinion based on our experiences or based on what we like to hear, perceived sound, a perceived sound in your head, you know? So, um, SCM Film says, I got the WA-76, going to get the 73 for tracking, love it. Sometimes I may EQ, he leaves EQ out, I may EQ out rather, between 250 and 500 to get so rid of some of that warm sound when I'm not looking for it. Yes, true. You know, you got to learn the characteristics of your equipment, you know, and that's what it gets down to, you know. So in terms of um, this unit being inferior in any way to an actual 1176, I think it gets down to based on looking on the inside of the components that went in it. It gets down to labor, you know, and I, and I would imagine, I would imagine that maybe some of the components used in an actual UA1176 are proprietary. Like Apple's operating system is proprietary only to Apple products. You know, like maybe they had a custom uh, wound transformer by jack down the block that you can't get because these are proprietary to our company alone and jack won't sell to you because we have a contract that says that he can't sell to our competitors you know it's a game it's a game but in, in the grand scheme of things the schematic is a schematic capacitors are capacitors resistors are resistors it depends on the quality of resistor and capacitor as well as other components you're putting and when i saw the borns pots the borns pots are this this unit these in here are Borns pots and they're high quality, non-failing potentiometers. So, I mean, you're getting some quality here, folks. You know, Borns pot here in the input as well as the output, the attack and the release all have, if I look under the thing, I would have to take this thing all the way apart like by removing um, quite a bit of boards to get to everything but when i see metal film resistors borns pots as well as um i forget what these are called i'll have to look these up again i, I i've seen them before that but i know you have to tweak them to get you know the the voltages right i've seen people who have made um preamps in the past but i do know quality components again look at this you have um nice polystyrene capacitors this yellow one right here if you can see where i'm pointing polystyrene capacitors you know neutrate connectors in the back quality connectors the pcb boards seem to be very well made um the only beef i think i might have with it is the fact that Maybe these, they should have put a shield around maybe the transformers because transformers can become noisy. I don't know if that's an issue. With the input, this is an input transformer, so I don't know if that you know does anything to the sound, but from what I can see, it appears to be pretty well made. You know, so if you got $2,400 to spend, I say go out and buy the original. If you're a little light in the funds department, then give this thing a shot. If it doesn't work out for you and again it, it it me saying it doesn't work out means that you have to put it through its paces side by side with an actual 1176 to make that determination there's just no other way okay i bet it sounds great he says too many people listen with their wallets 
That's true. <laughs> and if you're a manufacturer, you know the deal. Please, you got to have your finger on the pulse of what people want. That's why Warm Audio is making a killing. Period. Um, Like I said, it's economies of scale, man. It's economies of scale. Uh, let's see. Let's go for them. When mixing a song from John 4.15, a person is not going to know what compressor to use in. That's true. And listen, um, I forgot who it was that said that, said that to me. I think it might have been Bruce Woody and I was at a forum years ago when he was at the top of his career. He's very, very arrogant, pompous. You know, he was souped up at the time because he was on the top of the thriller thing. But um, he was like, yeah, I mean, in the end, ain't nobody whistling the name of the console that you recorded it on. And he recorded on Michael Jackson's vocals with the SN7. I bet like everybody reaching for Neumanns all the time, and his man using dynamic mic to record Michael Jackson's voice in the most weirdest of situations. Saying Michael likes to stand on wooden floors and he likes the reflections of. So I mean, you know, ain't nobody worried about it. You know that beat it sounds great, right? You know the lyric to it, so you know all the equipment used is irrelevant. Uh, Secret Army. I sent you an email with a couple of questions, but I know you're busy. Man. No, 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 no. But, you know, listen, I'll get back to you. Trust me on that. You know, yeah, I am busy. I got a little girl at home, but um, and now I'm I'm homeschooling. You know, that's a whole other story. B. I homeschool eight year eight year olds, man. That's that's kind of rough, man. It's kind of rough on a brother right now. So, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that privately. But yeah, that's crazy, man. I, 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 I got another story, but I ain't got, I ain't got, I, 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 I got to get, get y'all wrapped up in that, man, brother got stories, man, I, I've been around the block a while, but anywho, um, we're mixing the song, the consumer's not, yeah, he, he said, uh, Mr. Pirate Brand asks a throwback question, yes, Atari Dr. T back in the day, no, I did not, I had an, an Atari ST, I think that was the first computer I used in a studio setup. Um, maybe I'll find a picture of it and, and post it. But I used that with Cubase, with the dongle that used to go into the side, side of the computer. And as a matter of fact, Alan, if you go and on iTunes, look up Alan Glover's um, record, the, the Anticipated Dawn. I worked a lot on a lot of Alan Glover records. Anticipated Dawn was the record. And we did, ironically, Alan mastered Cubase to the point where he was using it for notation. He notated all the charts for the band using um that. I was stunned. I, even to this day, I don't know how he did it, man. I mean, he got that thing to work. And then he soldered to get more horsepower out of the computer. He soldered the RAM onto top of one another. I don't know. But yeah, but if you would check that out. Alan Glover's The Anticipated doing some good jazz for, for, for those of you all who like to um to um to um you listen to jazz music but yeah man um here we are here we are folks and i'm gonna tell you it's this is the deal how much money you want to spend you know you got 2400 dollars and don't and look at the bottom of that 398.99 right what do you see 25 four and a half stars ratings so that's telling you um this piece of equipment is already down in the trenches, you know, down in the trenches B and people are using it and putting it through pl its paces. I can tell you one thing that I can guarantee you golden age projects ain't got nobody 25 people liking this stuff because they're not putting no heart and soul in it. You know, Clark Technic is a respected company. They've been around for years, ever since I was a kid. And um, they're not going to put their good reputation on the line by producing something that's whack. You know, you know, before this stuff exits the door, man. And, and here's another argument. Oh, well, you know, it's manufactured by Behringer. OK, and what's your point? Yeah, Behringer got their hand in the, in, in the pot. So and that's not making Yeah, Behringer has done their own level of damage to themselves based on. Um. Um, mismanagement from a mismanagement from a um, administrative perspective, you know, not realizing early on that, hey, you know, what you put out and what you produce to the public at large is going to be a direct reflection 
on the name of your company. And I use the analogy of like Samsung back in the day was always considered a um, inferior company when you talk about comparing them to Sony. Of course. But who's the top provider of televisions in America right now? Samsung. Listen, it all comes around, B. It all comes around. 360 degrees. One of these days, they get it. They get it. And they realize, hey, man, I can't be screwing around putting my name on the line or on stuff that's inferior because people are going to start to match me with that. So I got to turn the co corner at some point. And I think Behringer has done that. You know, they've been sued enough. That's for sure. You, I'm sure they learned their lesson from Mackie. They, they've been copying people's stuff for years, but they finally realized, listen, let's get our act together let, from an administrative and a corporate standpoint, and let's start doing it right. And I think they have their hand in Clark Technic right now, and they're doing it right. So I opened the thing up, man. I opened it up. And I can tell you, the components on the inside are quality components. Fact check me by going to mouser.com. I'm going to put all of the information in the description below. For those of you who want to actually go and see for yourself that building an actual DIY 1176 is a not difficult and b not very expensive, not expensive at all, you know, so you can you can just, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, show us pictures. I would love to see you back in the day. Uh, I listen, let's go on my, um, you can go on the, the rhythm studio web. There's plenty of pictures of me back in the day. You go on my Facebook when I was a youngster, you know, but, um, plenty of pictures, plenty of pictures, man. I'm not a hidden figure. That's for sure. You know, plenty of pictures of a brother when he was fat, not a shape, you know, get past 40 and stuff starts sagging. You know what I mean? B? For those of you who are past 40, don't be trying to play yourself like you still got it high and tight. You know, it take a little effort to keep it high and tight. All right. <laughs> Berenger won the lawsuit with Mackey, did they? I had no idea. But I do know they they are famous for ripping people. Stay like that. What's it, the man that ripped off Marvin Gaye's song? Um, um, I forget. You help me. The artist. Rip the man's song off keys the progressions and everything almost down to the melody and gonna be like it's original Psh, ain't no original about it you know they ripped off let's get it on and you're gonna talk about it's original yeah it's original to marvin Gaye. you know you know went and stole the man's stuff and they're gonna call it your own sam somebody i don't know you know I, when i was in music school that did the um, one of my professors said, well you know all composers borrow from people and he ain't borrow. that was a direct ripoff yeah um so yeah man um any further questions and um i'm gonna put this thing through its paces you know i'm gonna go up to um i'm not a bass player but i'm gonna go up to storage and take my bass out of storage and i'm just gonna slap around on it you know bap, 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 and um i'm gonna put it through its paces i'm gonna play some lines on on the keys bass through it and see how it sounds you know and um I'll get back to you all. But from what I can see, it's well made, man. I don't think you're going to go wrong. Robin Thick, Yeah, yeah, man. No, no, it wasn't Robin Thick. Um, ba da dee ba Then you're loving all. I forget his name. Sam somebody, man. Dude, if it was... No, Robin Thick. Uh, he wrote a lot of stuff for um brian mcknight but if it was robin thick then yeah man he got himself in a lot of hot water with that one that was a direct ripoff of let's get it on i don't care what nobody say you know sing <laughs> doo -doo. yeah it's all good b but um any further questions about this unit about what to expect from a fet compressor you know other than it's insanely fast Attack time. I'm going to put the top back on this thing real quick. You know. And um, this was not sent to me by um, Clock Technic. I took a die roll. And from what I could see, you know, I made a pretty decent choice. 
you know, for someone who's going to do nothing more, who who's not a fan of an 1176, I'm not because I this to me it's very very aggressive sounding. You know, some things you just know what you want to hear, and you reach for that, you know, piece of equipment. And for many years, look at this. Like I said to you all, this thing is is over 38 years old. It's a 163. At the first time I came in in um touch with a actual dbx 163 i have the original box and everything okay um was when i was with um dana reed look him up and he was doing some demos for a client of his at the time at unique unique recording studio here in new york and um at the time i was like wow that really sounds good on vocals so it was my mission that that was going to be one of my first compressors, compressors and that we're going way back into like maybe early 80s. So um yeah man, brother's got got some some history with GBX. You know. So for those of you short on funds, DBS 166s are being especially the USA models. If you find one on eBay, snatch it. Snatch it. Snatch it. It's a very very good investment. Because the USA model, something happened to the DBXs once they um, sent their manufacturer over to Hong Kong. I didn't like the sound of them after that, you know. But, um, aha, uh -huh, was that stimulus? <laughs> AOB, nah, it wasn't stimulus money, man. I don't be playing that. Just playing stimulus money. Brother earned his stuff, man. But no, it wasn't. Um, Actually, it was just, you know, um... Spare cash, you know, have laying around. I listen when you're in business, man. You can't be screwing around, man. I got lights, I got expenses. I'm not over here dilly dallying around, you know. And um, and um, you know, one thing when you're in business, if you've been in, if for those of you who are ever entertaining the thought of going into business, you have to diversify. I learned that years ago. You know, diversification is, is Sam Smith. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Sam Smith ripped Marvin Gaye off, folks. Okay, I digress. But when you're in business, um, you have to make decisions that are going to affect you years from now. You know, financial decisions, especially when 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 you when you um, you're a small business. That's why I feel for coffee shops right now and barber shops and all these people, man, because. There's no way for them to diversify. Now, if you were smart and you were a person who had access to, you know, a a a um successful business and you're well vested, you know, back when I was, you know, years ago, I had a small label that serviced independent gospel artists and they were performing artists and you could sell CDs and that money, I was like, you know, when we when we did the relations record, I was like, okay, well, buy some property. You know, so that's what I did. I bought real estate, man. And you got to diversify so that you know that, you know, and this is any business person or any successful person knows that. And even hip hop folk, you know, you may think, oh, they making all their money, you know, they rolling in banking, and and um, just music is there. No, they don't make the. You know, how music is such a insignificant portion of a performer's portfolio financial portfolio please ain't a person out there maybe other than Beyonce that can and Rihanna Jay-Z and maybe a handful of other hot artists right now that can say yeah I know Andre Harrell passed away today I was just listening to Mary J Blige's first record um um on the first cut and he was like hey Mary this is Andre Harrell you know I heard your record you're on your way Oh, and then the next day I look up and the man passed away. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, man. I mean, life is short. You know, that was that 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 slapped me like crazy, man. But um, his legacy lives on, man. His legacy lives on. He's one of the New York's finest, that's for sure. Yeah, but if you if you're a smart man, business person, you're always gonna diversify. Period. You know, because you got to expect downtime. Everybody ain't on the mountaintop. So for those of y'all, what? Little Richard died today? Also? Hey, that's scary, B. That's scary. That's scary. 
Wow, they checking out. Yes. Sheesh. Wow. But um, yeah, you gotta um, you have to think about tomorrow. You can't be, you know, I I stand by what I preach. You know, this was not stimulus money. That was money that I could afford to part with because um, I want to provide good inf information to the masses. You know, and I got highly tired of seeing arbitrary knob twisting reviews on this equipment. So I did some research and say, wait a minute, this thing, thing is almost a direct copy, you know, of the original. And I'm look, I looked at the schematic. I went to an actual schematic and looked at the um, schematic of an actual 1176 that was built by Yuri back in the day. And it's off patent. So if the information is readily available to everybody. That means you can go to anyone and um, pull the um, information off and make your own. You know? But, um, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, Robin Thicke did Blurred Lines, which ripped off Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up. Yeah, yeah. Got to Give It Up. These folks, man. Listen, that's a whole other topic. I had an opinion on that. But, um... Who's this? Um, Salter Zo, uh, Salter Zo, Salter Zo says, I guess the decision is KT76 versus the many plug-in emulations. Does it offer an advantage? Also, I'm told that if you push the 76 hard, the noise level gets way loud. No, no, no. It's not noise. It's a, um, distortion that, um, you know, you may like or may not. Um, I could point you in the direction of, um, of, of, of songs that probably have used it. I will do that when I run it through its own paces, you know, independent of the live stream. But, um, like I said, it's a love hate. You either love it or you don't. And for the many years that I've encountered it outside of my place, I, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to spend $2,400 on a vanity piece. that's going to sit in a rack and just to make, I've tried that. I've done stupid stuff like that before with buying an Avalon 7 um, 47 just to say I had an Avalon. That thing sat in the rack for years. $3,000 just sitting there looking pretty. You don't buy equipment for it to look pretty. You buy it for it to be used. But am I going to spend $2,500 on some $2,400 on something just for it to be a vanity piece? No, it's a tool. So if I got to experiment, I would rather experiment with something that's well-made, substantially cheaper, in this case, by the number of $2,000 versus $2,400. I mean, that's what it gets down to, you know? Um, and he said, he's told that, the, that if you push the 76K, 76K to the, whole, the noise level gets way loud. No, it's not. No, I think it's all the build quality, as I've just attested to, live by opening this thing up is perfect in every way perfect the build quality it's just the characteristic of a field effect transistor and this is any transistor which is why tube sounds so beautiful when you drive a tube hard you get second third fourth order harmonics to this i'm getting all technical now tubes impart Harmonics. Harmonics can be likened if you if you have a, an acoustic piano, right? And hold down the C above middle C and then hit the middle C. Just tap it. Boom. You're going to hear the harmonic of the upper octave of that C that you just hit. That it can be a like or akin to that. So Tubes give you that harmonic distortion. A transistor gives you straight away squaring off of the wave you're trying to run through it. You may like that. You may not. That's why I say you can't get all heavy handed with the way you're setting. You got to be a little delicate. You have to find a sweet spot. And it can be somewhat frustrating of a learning curve, especially if you are, if you get in the studio with someone, if you're doing vocals, for instance, and the person has poor mic technique like, and the poor control of their dynamics in terms of delivery, in the terms of the way that they're, they're, they're coming across in the production, it's going to frustrate you. And you're thinking it's you. 
It's not you. You know, you're trying to find a sweet spot and you're trying to uh, make an adjustment for someone who has poor mic technique. And it's like you're fighting an uphill battle, you know? And then, and then, and also take, for instance, if you're recording snare drum, you know, you know that as you approach the outside of the shell of outside of the head of a drum, the closer you get to the shell, the more resonance and ring you get. Yet when you hit the drum dead center, it's more dead. Imagine having to record a snare drum with a drummer who is just failing to maintain the pocket by hitting it in the middle. You're going to be frustrated. You mean like, okay, let's just change the compressor. And it's not you. You got to direct. You have to, that's what production is. You're directing them. Listen, you know, I know I got this thing set because I did a sound check earlier and everything is perfect. Can you please hit right here in the middle? You know, and then we're all guilty. We're all guilty as players of coming through that and learning the proper way to record ourselves or to record instruments or to record vocals, you know, and sometimes hitting the mark, sometimes missing the mark, you know, but you have to know what's going to make this piece work for you. And the, and, and, and that only comes through experimentation. So it gets back to the question. Do you want to experiment at what cost? $2,400 or 400 pick you know that's what it gets down to how much money you want to just lay and they'd be dilly dallying around f trying to figure it out if you got that kind of money to expend i say okay it's a hand rate made piece go for it you know but if you ain't got that kind of money then i'm telling you the bill quality on is just as good and if you still don't like it, and if you are able to put yourself in a situation where it's side by side with the original, and you hear an obvious difference, then that's a that's that's a whole other topic. I'm not gonna argue with you. I I will be the last person to argue with you. Why? Because you put it through its actual paces, which is why I keep saying to folk, I have an original 1073 by AMS Need. Okay. I have a warm audio, WA-73. What has spent more time outside my rack on loan to, to a friend? The 1073. That was my daily driver for a minute. I guess folks was, was kind of calling up, oh, you ain't got no 1073, or you don't have an HA-73. They do, I do, but they, what's going to be my daily drive? I have to work, folks. These are tools. They're not toys. They're tools. And if I'm telling you something is working, if it ain't broke, why are you trying to go and fix it? Leave it alone. It's working. So if the person coming, hey man, you need that that piece back that you loan me? No, I don't need it right now. I'm, I'm I'm able to get by. You know, I'm all right. You know, so it gets a matter of listen. John, John Kilgore is using, and he's he's a multi a good friend of mine, and a multi Grammy winning, um, engineer. Beautiful man, great soul and all, all right? Great person, beautiful person. He uses the Heritage HA-73s in addition to his other preamps. He ain't got no complaints. The man that produced how many Grammys with those Heritage? Okay, so they're tools. They are tools, people. Can I stop getting hate mail? I mean, even last week, somebody like, hey, man. Warm audio stuff is garbage. Okay. I disagree with you. You're trying to bait me into an argument. That's your opinion. It works for me. Maybe it just didn't work out for you. That's fine. You know, everyone's mileage may vary. So, um, let's move on. Ninja, it can turn a sine wave into something. Yes. That's my point. Yeah. If you look, if you get in with an oscilloscope. I see we're getting t deep and technical now, but that's where the... the dislike for the unit comes in at you know you hit all buttons in and then you get this like oh my word type sound like oh that's like crazy aggressive but if you it's, it depends on the genre that you're you know you like for maybe hard driven rock drums being played by chad smith you know or kenny arnoff these these power rock guys you know they're gonna be like yo this is off the chart you know 
whereby maybe not so if you're dealing with a J.R. Robinson who is more of a session pocket type drummer. You're going to be like, mm, you know, that may be a little too much for me. It depends on who you, on what you're using it on and who you're talking to. You know, so I advocate staying far away from folks that's up here. They running a kick drum through and they doing this. Then they doing this. Then they something. they do this. Then they do that. That's nonsensical. It makes no sense to me at all. I'm I'm just saying, if I sat with them, I'd be like, uh, why are you doing that? Because that is not actual use. That tells me that you 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 would you you don't do this on the regular. You know that if you got a vocalist, you sound checking, you're gonna okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. You're looking at your meters. You're looking at your meter to see how much gain reduction I want. How much she's going to have it verse two or he. How much gain reduction I'm going to have over the entire course of the recording. And you're using all this information. What ratio am I going to use? Is eight to one too aggressive? Should I use four to one? How much? You got to be judicious. You can't be all crazy and like a demented engineer just twisting knobs. The attack time is way over here. It makes no sense. And I'm not saying that to, 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 um, as a point of criticism, I'm just saying it from a technical perspective. If you took that person and set them with John Kilgore, he'd be like, thank you. Uh, sh show him the door because he apparently does not know how to get the right sound. Look at someone like Simon Phillips. If you go on his uh, uh, website, he's very delicate. And the Brits are like that. Even um, um, the guy from, um, not Pure Mix, James, um, Pro Tools. I'll, get, I'll link him in, in the description below. But they're very, very delicate. They're very judicious. They make small changes. Because with certain pieces of equipment, Small changes have huge effects, such as the squaring off of a wave that's being run through it. So you can't be bombastic and crazy and turning knobs like a crazy person on a client gig. You can't. You can't. You can't. Because it ain't no need you trying to get over on the person that's signing your check at the end of the day. They'll know if you BS and them or not. Because the client in, in, in the end, has you have to provide them with the best possible quality sound. That's your job. That's the engineer's job. End the story, you know, point blank, full stop. I, I, I say that to all the young people that come through here. Your Pro Tools expert, James, Ivy, yes. Very, very delicate move. Very delicate. You know? And there's no crime in not knowing how to set something. That's fine. That's why if you have to experiment, I think it's a lot cheaper <laughs> to experiment at $400 than $2,400. I am not saying that this is better. I'm saying is that do you necessarily want a vanity piece or are you going to use this as a tool? Because it has to be your daily driver. It has to be the thing that you're going to reach and go to. You know, and getting back to the whole warm and and need debate, there is an, a, a difference in the way one sounds versus the other. Not in a bad way, in their own individual characteristic way. You know what I mean? That I happen to like. Now, I've experienced overdriving warm and overdriving the need. I happen to like the way the needs transformer sound overdriven that does not mean that i'm going to arbitrarily overdrive my equipment that's foolish no client's going to take a distorted signal and say thank you sir here's the check i'll be back for some more work no that's not going to happen so it's a matter of knowing what your your equipment is capable of providing you in the end i mean that's what it gets down to man as far as I'm concerned. So yes, 
Um, Ninja45 says, try sending your drum bus to the 76. Yeah. Um, time corrected so that you don't have the phase issues. Yes. And then mix it underneath. Yeah, for par Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, as a parallel effect. Yes. I would imagine if you did use it on a stereo drum bus and you like that aggressive crunch that you're going to get from it. Absolutely. Very good. Links for Life also says, I used the 76 into the two-way for... Now, that's got to be killing. That's I'd like to hear that combo. That's got to be killing. You know what I mean? That's a good chain right there, man. You know? Um, so, um, with that in mind, um, like I said, we've looked at the comparison. From what you can see with your own two eyes right here, they are the same on paper the only difference technically is that one is handmade the other is not okay the components inside the clark technic are quality components again mouser m-o-u-s-e-r dot com for you to um verify what i'm talking about and I will put links in the comments below for you to look at these DIY forms that provided me with the bill of materials of which I tally and it's like about approximately $397. That's for the case, the components, the buttons, knobs, everything that went into it. So essentially, when you look at it from 10,000 feet, you're paying for the labor of a handmade piece of equipment. Just like the Manley's uh, and, and very mu, you know, anytime you get a handmade piece of equipment, just like, uh, the Brent Avril, not Brent Avril, BA, they call themselves now, but it was Brent Avril Enterprises, the, um, company out in California, they make their stuff. It's a handmade piece. You're going to pay for that labor, you know, and there's going to be a, a, a difference in sound quality to a degree, you know? But it all gets down to the componentry that you put in the unit. Fall short at one point or the other in the manufacturer, then you're going to have a major difference in sound quality. But the only way for one to impart that information to anyone is to say, hey, listen, you know, I put these things side by side. 1176 original as against this. And there was a major difference. It would have to come from a person that can give you that information accurately. Don't be just listening to some of these folks on YouTube just twisting knobs like crazy people. You know, because in the end, you have to be, you're buying this thing, man. You got to know and be comfortable in knowing that you're making an informed decision based on fact. So I'm not saying I, I'm giving you, fact check me. Go to Mouser, M-O-U-S-E-R dot com. They are a provider of electronic components. And look, look how much, look how cheap. Resistors are a penny. Capacitors is our nickel. So warm audio has mastered economies of scale. They buy these things in bulk. They probably got walls of all this components, knobs and all that. And they say, hey, let's ship X amount of these off and we'll pay for the menu, China, Chinese manufacturing at $2 an hour versus a guy like a BAE where they're going to charge you maybe $30 plus dollars an hour for the manufacturer. Maybe I'm just giving you a roundabout figure, but in the end, you're looking at um, the cost of manufacture, which is inflating the overall cost that's being passed on to the consumer. You know, so it's, it's a business proposition in, in the end. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, Links for Life says a very sweet sounding. Yes. And Black Hippie Drum, Black Drum Hippie. Hey, what's up, man? I love these names, man. I love these names, man. Well, I'm glad to see you here, brother. Um, what pre's do you run your toms through? Ironically, for toms, I like, I prefer the APIs, 512Cs. That's just for toms. Because I found that when you run toms, unless you're playing a certain genre of music, um, I don't have, have actual APIs. That's my preference. I do have the Fredensteins, which are uh, artistic mic pre's. A, a lot of people sleeping on those also. Very well made. 
company, um, very well respected company with a German design. Um, they are, have replicated the artistic Mike Pre to be a 512C, which sounds great on the rack toms. Now for some beef and bottom, I will use the Neve or a Neve-esque um, sort of, um, and I have two um, by Five Fish Studios. These are a boutique which have Carn Hills on them in the end, so they give me a lot. On bigger toms, I like a lot of girth, you know, so that's my go-to. But for the rack toms, I prefer to have a little bit more air and a little more mid-range. You know, if you make them too bottom heavy, then they sound, if you're an R&B player, then it's gonna sound more like rock drums. And then if you use a certain type of head, um, like the pinstripes, then you're gonna be like, you're gonna get a lot of boominess out of it. Maybe more than you probably like, or you might like it, I don't know. It, 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 it depends on everybody's different. You know, and if you're a drummer, you know what you wanna hear. You know exactly how you want your drums to come up and if you like the way pinstripe sound and if you like the way pinstripe heads sound on 10s 12s and 14s then you know if you want some girth then you're going to go with something that's going to give you something that's going to give a fat sound and the neves will give you that fat sound i prefer i use coated um ambassadors as well as emperors and coated emperors in most situations if i'm playing r&b my tom sizes are 10 8 12 9 and for jazz, it's 12, 8, 10, 7 if I'm using two rack toms and 12, 8 if it's 12, 8 and 14, 14. So, and I use coated heads because of the, the tone that I could get from it. And, 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 and sometimes I want more of a choked feel as opposed to a rounder sort of tone that the pinstripes give you. So it depends on the drummer. Everybody's different, you know, so you know what you want to hear. If you're a drummer and you know you want that, that um, fat round sort of tone, then you you better off going with something that's going to give you that. And the closer you mic a tom, as well, that's going to give you a lot more shell resonance. So, you know, everybody's different. But thanks for your question, man. I and I appreciate you being here, really, man. Black drum hippie, that's cool. Um, here's another um question. Order from Stan Audio, and by the time you get it, <laughs> their kids worked on it by hand. You're basically buying gear for your retirement. That's why I don't be sending my money out the country. Somebody uh, emailed me recently that has a horror story, a horror story about waiting nearly a year to get something back from them. They all the way in Chile, Chile. I mean, how do you, the only thing you can say is that you lost that money. You know, everybody's chasing the latest and greatest in sound, you know? When if when you if you were um, looking at it from the perspective of how is this piece of equipment going to serve me best, based on what I need, you know, so um, James Stanford uh, says he hi I'm new to your site. What converters are you using these days? My trusty converter, if I'm going out of the box, is still my Apogee Rosetta, to this day. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've been following me any duration of time, you know that I've been on this quest to mix or to deliver my mixes in a high res um, fashion outside of the box as of late. And I've been looking at varying, confer varying converters by my tech digital is one of my, um, top choices as well as, uh, iterations by Orion. Um, but those are some of my favorites. And right now, because of this whole coronavirus thing and, most studios are not um, accepting clients, you know, myself included, having some things fall by the wayside. Um, I'm still using my Apogee Rosetta, which you can see right over here, which is a workhorse, man. It's a workhorse. Um, any further questions? Off topic, but do you have any thoughts on the Tascam DA3000 as a master recorder? Um, yeah, you, most of you guys know that um, I've been touting that as a go-to that's coming from al schmidt and um and um i was talking with bob clear mountain uh back at the last aes and he's still an out-of-the-box guy i i don't know maybe it's just those of us who are over 40 who that's our point of reference you know just that out-of-the-box sound um again like i was listening to mary j last night and um 
you know, knowing that a lot of her records were done at studios like Chung King, knowing that sound, man, that you're gonna get just from 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 um that analog tone and going out of the box. It's just that two dimensional thing that's happening with Pro Tools. It's just I can't get with it. And I've been, you know, on this quest to to, to um reconnect, you know, my ear to the past of what I've been used to hearing. Um I don't know. If, uh, let me see if I could play to give you all. I don't know how well your systems are, but I was listening to a CD I did some time ago, years ago, as a matter of fact. And I just want to play um, what the point that I'm trying to make about the airiness that I was used to in hearing. This is old, you know, dated music, but at the same time, it still provides me, you know, anyone a good idea of what I'm trying to say. The way I recorded that, um, when I'm, you know, just to, you know, jump back on that topic, no one can tell you a, a where that was recorded. No, not, not one of you could tell me or how it was recorded. But the point that I'm trying to make is that analog provides you, prov always will provide you with a depth. Now, I don't know how many of you were able to listen over headphones. And this will be available as playback on on the on the replay, but there's a three dimension thing front to back, side to side that happens. Um, that comes from me manually setting a lexicon reverb in a particular way, early early and late reflections, and the size of this space that it's in, and all of those little individual parameters that go into making an acoustic environment along with how it's recorded you know it's it's all it's it's the um it's the um they say the the sum of the parts is greater than the whole you know so when you're looking at a situation like okay, well what pre was this used and what reverb was used and what mic and how was the mic positioned and in what it's a whole lot of detail that goes into um, recording now a lot of that dynamic range can be captured in Pro Tools don't get me wrong but when you're delivering for 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 um, iTunes or for Spotify they're gonna put a codec on top of it that's going to rob you out of um, out of um, some bits now, when you want to, it's going to thin out the sound. Once you're being robbed because of the codec, it's going to thin the sound now. And James said, I hear the beef in the road. So you're going to get that, you know, that, that girth, that, that, the width that you get from it. And I'm going to do another video covering some more analog stuff that I've done in the past, but, um, I'm trying to capture that. And I've, and I've been working with Pro Tools. No, I've been exclusively recording in Pro Tools 19 years. I started, I did my first session all in Pro Tools in 2001. No, 2000. So that makes 20 years in, in June will be the first time I ever recorded a session fully and used the master from Pro Tools. And that was in an audio media situation. But, um, but at the, at the same time, um, 20 years forward, and you would think that, you know, that, the, the, the ability to capture all of that dimension would somehow return. It's returned for people like Al Schmidt. Listen to his recordings. He's an out-of-the-box recorder. He uses a DA3000. He delivers a high-resolution file to mastering. That's what it gets back to. 
you know? So, you know, and you know what, James, you make a good point. You said try Studio One. Uh, you know, you, you raise a good point because people like Personas, and, and, and to be honest, I'm going to give some credit to Logic Pro X. A lot of these um, independent door manufacturers are starting to realize that they need to up their game in terms of maybe how, or, or, or rather the mathematics that goes into providing that depth. You know, I've heard good things being said about Studio One. So yeah, um, I'm not ready to switch over to us because most of the times if I'm doing a project, excuse me, if I'm doing a project that has to be used by a, a end user, someone down the chain other than myself, I have to provide what the client is asking for. And, and, and almost nine times out of 10, it's a Pro Tools file. So, you know, I'm under some sort of stringent requirements. In other circumstances, I have used Logic Pro. So, but um, yeah, I do understand your point about trying an, another door to, to maybe find that. You know, but, you know, but anytime you jump, um, um, ship from one circumstance to the other, you're going to, you know, experience a learning curve. And, you know, just like I had mentioned in the Luna situation, I don't have time to sit down and learn something from the ground up. You know, for me, time is money and, um, it can be better spent in other circumstances, you know? He said, is user friendly with Pro Tools shortcut, short, shortcuts? Okay. You know, I don't know. Is it, tell me, is it downloadable for free? I'm willing to give it a look. You know, that's the one thing. So let me know if, if it can be downloaded for free. But um, this has been good, man. So um, let's begin to head around the clubhouse turn. Let's do a quick wrap up. You have four choices when you're going to purchase a um, compressor. They are FET, VCA, Optical, and MU. Okay? Know that FET is going to have an aggressive tone to the sound. You have to be okay with that. Okay? VCA is a little bit more forgiving because it uses not only a chip, but mathematics to um, give you maybe a sweeter, more, more forgiving compression sound. Optical uses light, which is going to give you a slower attack time than most and mu is just like butter on the cake anytime you use a mu based compressor and like i said by the way optical designs like the la2a uses tubes so you're kind of getting the best of both worlds the nice warm sound from a cathode tube as well as you know a a forgiving attack time that's not aggressive that lets the transients through a bit and um, it's great for vocals and maybe acoustic instruments. So, you know, you're getting the best of both worlds when you use an LA-2A type of compressor. What you can expect from a FET compressor is being flexible. As long as you're not heavy-handed, you know, it could sound great on drums, vocals, guitar cabinets. Um, it's going to give you some character when you overdrive it. Um, it may be good for most pop music applications because chances are when you're listening to popular music day you're hearing it in action and expect to be somewhat dissatisfied if you don't set this thing properly because it's going to be aggressive and you're going to be like oh my god did i just let an ogre out of the cave here so um expect that if you don't take time to really learn where the sweet spot is for certain genres of music that you might be working on a side-by-side -side comparison the proof is in the pudding b I ain't gonna lie to y'all. So, I mean, you could take this for what it's worth. Um, you know, side by side, they're, 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 they're identical. You know, maybe not in build quality because one is handmade, the other is not. But beyond that, there's no disputing that they're pretty much the same. That's a fact. And in the final analysis, your pocketbook has to be the judge. Okay. Do you want to spend $2,400 on a handmade unit that may perform the same as its $400 counterpart just to have a vanity piece? If you're in the position where you can afford that, fine. I am not saying don't go out and buy an 1176. I advocating buy, um, buying American. You know, I believe in supporting American companies. Don't get me wrong. But if you're a little light on the funds, 
I would imagine that this thing is going to be able to hold up the light to an 1176. And this is based on my personal research of the fact that it costs only 397, approximately 397 dollars in parts to build an actual 1176. I've provided you with the sources to double check me. That's Mouser, M-O-U-S-E-R.com. And the information that was provided with me to me with regards to the cost is by a DIY forum on Mason, M-A-S-O-N, audio.org. You can go to those sites yourself, look, and um, the proof, as they say, is in the pudding, you know. So with that in mind, I just want to say thank you to everyone who, you know, showed up today. I appreciate you, you know, and um, I'm going to leave you with the sweet voice of Mike Jackson. Not the Michael Jackson. His name was Mike Jackson. He's a gospel singer out of New York. So I thank you guys for tuning in. All right. Have a good afternoon. Without a doubt